It's great to see all of you here. Y'all good? Um, I've seen a lot of permagrin this morning, by the way, after last night. And come on, if you just love football, I mean, all the way around, it was just one of those nights where everyone's like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. Unless, of course, you're a Georgia fan. Anyway, I didn't say that, but i just not going there. If you're a Georgia fan, you can come get me later. That's fine. Um, hey, today we're going to start a new message series that we've entitled Make War. And uh, this is not a sermon or a series title that you often hear at a church, uh, but you'll see how this all plays out and how this is going to work here in just a minute. But we're going to kick that off today. It's going to run for several weeks. Um, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verses 10 through 14. Uh, today as we kind of lay out the path of where we're going to go with this series. If you have your Bibles or your smartphones or your iPads or whatever you have, uh, you may want to go ahead and turn there to Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10, and we'll get there in just a minute. Um, I have to admit to you that I I am uh, a little bit of a sucker for a good war movie. Um, Those old war movies, the new ones, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter, or um, like documentaries where they've documented things like the Vietnam War or what's been happening in Afghanistan and stuff like that. and Not so much that I'm a big fan of war, by the way, because that would definitely not be it, but it's just, I think it's really just amazing to me to watch men and women make this commitment to serve. You know, because of an ideal, because of something they believe in, something maybe they've been called to, this ideal of freedom, but more even than that is just to protect what we have back here, to protect other people. I'm going to go out here and do this and maybe pay the ultimate sacrifice just even for other people. And um, I just I think that's interesting and amazing. And, and, but war is just a, this is the unfortunate reality of this world that we live in, isn't it? It's been going on ever since the beginning of time, you know. And really, we know it's the result of sin and, and brokenness. Whenever sin entered the equation of this world, uh, we began to see people going at it, at odds with each other, and it's been going on ever since then. Now, the Bible talks about not only that reality of the war that we see, but it also talks about this other battle that is raging all the time, a war that we may not see physically with our eyes, but we see the product of it, and it's this battle that rages in the spiritual realm, and... uh, We might think of it as like good versus evil or light versus darkness or the father of truth versus the father of lies or just literally God versus Satan. But but it's this battle that's happening kind of behind the scenes. And um, it's very much a part of this world we live in. It's not something we can deny or something we can even disassociate ourselves from. Uh, I'm going to read you a quote. I thought this was good. It said, spirituality is not something on the fringes or an option for those with a particular bent, none of us has a choice. Everyone has to have a spirituality. Everyone does have one, either a life-giving one or a destructive one. We are spiritual beings. All of us are. And therefore, we will, as it says, either have this spirituality that is life-giving or one that is destructive. And it's, those are the choices that we make throughout our life as to how that's going to go for us. And so this is kind of a reality that we have to deal with, and um, Paul in the New Testament talks about it. And it's here in Ephesians 6 that he really gets clear about what this looks like and and what we do in light of it. So let's get to to this passage, and we're going to read 10 through 13, as Paul is encouraging and instructing the believers in that day who, because of their faith, were under persecution and uh, were kind of in a physical battle as as, as well as a spiritual battle. So he says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, once again, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. I love that last part. It's like, stand your ground and then when you've done everything else, stand again. Because at the end of the day, God is giving you what you need to stand. So Paul is kind of claiming something for us. He's saying it's not like a battle that you're in. You know, th- This is not like a war. He's saying this is one. This is the reality 
of the situations that we're in. And God is calling us in his kingdom to be on guard and be aware of that all the time. And something else interesting that he says is, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and the rulers and authorities and, and darkness and all these other things. And, but isn't it so true that when we find ourselves in conflict with somebody else, that battle is a very real thing. And oftentimes, that other person is the enemy, right? When we're angry, we've been hurt, we're bitter, we want revenge, and so we reach back into our quiver and we pull out an arrow and we pull that bow back and we want to hit them with the arrow you know and unfortunately that's that flesh part of us that wants to get back at that other person but Paul is saying hey wait a minute don't forget the battle is really not between you and that person physically it's this other spiritual thing that is happening here if you're angry if you're resentful, if you're bitter and all those things, you know what? God didn't brew that up. The enemy did. And he loves for you to just play in it. He loves for you to go after it. He wants you to throw that arrow out there. And every time you do, he gets a victory. And God's saying, don't give it to him. Don't let him have these victories in, in that kind of a way. Use something else in these battles. Instead of using hate and, and revenge, why don't you use love? Why don't you turn that thing around? Why don't you pray for them and let God do his work in that relationship? You know, that's the other realm that we're talking about here that Paul's trying to emphasize, you know, in this battle. Pay attention. Make war against the enemy, the true enemy, and use the armor of God and use what he has to offer because what we have is not adequate and what we need is what God is providing for us. So that's what he's talking about in here. Now he goes on in this next verse, and this is the beginning of a list. What does the armor look like? What is it that we're putting on that's helping us? And so this morning we're going to look at this very first one. And in 14 he says this, Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Now frankly, when I read this passage, I'm thinking, I'm not sure I would list the belt as the first piece of the armor. You know, I'd be like, maybe the helmet or the the breastplate or you know the sword or something else a little bit more you know come on the belt um but belts are very important um kind of on a side note have you ever seen mythbusters on discovery channel or anybody out there watch that show yeah okay so one time they had a mythbuster deal where this police officer was wearing his police belt and it stopped a bullet and uh, he actually came on and he showed the bell buckle had a big dent in it and everything and i don't think they could reproduce it in mythbusters so they didn't know what to deal with that but so anyway, there you go, Mythbusters. That's a little side sum for you. Belts could potentially stop bullets, but probably likely not. But here's the deal. A long time ago, in, in the ancient Roman army, belts were extremely important and very vital to the armor that they wore. They were uh, called a cingulum, is what the belt was known as. It was usually a heavy leather belt that was worn around the waist like we would. It looked like... Uh, have you ever seen a weightlifter's belt? You know, it's big wide in the back, and, you know, it's kind of, kind of heavy duty. And that's what they would wear, something like that. And it served several purposes. One is that they hung leather strips off of it that added uh, protection. And it kind of hung over the top of their, and I don't know what else to call this, a skirt. <laughs> I'm sure a Roman soldier would love for me to call that a skirt. It's really not. But anyway, and, uh, and so it hung, that belt was important to support that. Also, it held the scabbard for the sword. So if you go into battle without your belt, you're also going into battle without your scabbard and therefore without your sword. A Roman soldier without a sword is only on the defense <laughs> and mostly running. So uh, that belt was very important and was kind of core to the rest of the armor of what they had that day. Now also, another purpose was that it, it provided support for their midsection, for the core. And here's why that was important. Um, when a Roman army was on the battlefield, and by the way, during that day, they were the conqueror of the world. They had the latest in military gear and strategy. But a whole unit of soldiers would get together in a big, what looks like a big square, a rectangle. And uh, so when they were engaging the enemy, if the enemy was coming toward them, the front row would hold up their shields, and they had this little interesting deal. They had flanges on the inside of each of their shields so they could literally lock them together. 
So they, they required each other to be able to form the strategy, right? So all these soldiers locking shields, holding on tight. And then the guys behind them in the second row, they started their shields up here like this, and they made like a roof over them in case they were shooting arrows. And, uh, and then, you know, so you kind of had this neat box formation all around them. So the enemy comes and, and mostly just crashes against that first row of soldiers, first wave. And what happened was the guys on the second row behind the, the front row, they would hold on to the belt of the guy in front of them, and they would push, you know, holding their shield, their shield up like this, and they would push against them. Then the guys on the third row, same thing with the second row. They're pushing. Everybody's pushing up so that they can support that first row, the guys with the shields who are out front. So the enemy would just come and crash against this formation and wouldn't be able to do anything with it. And then in the, in the appropriate time, shields go up, they push each other forward, and they go on the attack. And I know that sounds very simplistic the way I've described it. I'm sure it's much more complicated than that. But this formation was one of the basic core formations of the Roman army that allowed them to be such a force in that day. But the belt was important in two ways in that formation. One is it, it kept them from getting a hernia. Okay, they, you know, it's just one of those things where you tighten up your belt, you don't get a hernia when you're, when you're pushing and straining, and it just kind of kept everything in play, and then also it provided this handhold so that they could push each other forward. So anyway, you get the idea, the cingulum, the belt that was very important for them, helped them stand their ground, and that's a military phrase, and that's where we get it from, stand your ground, and Paul adopts that phrase and uses it here to talk about spiritually. When he says, he talks about stand your ground, then at the end you'll be able to stand. Now, in the spiritual realm, the belt of truth has sort of a similar effect. It is the core of this armor that God has given us. It, it represents this important piece of this armor that we have. Truth is at the core of our belief system. And in the Greek, the word truth is aletheia. And it means, it kind of has several variations of meaning, but basically it means disclosed or unconcealed to to open something up so that you can see what's on the inside and here's my very simple and mostly rusty illustration of that it's a candy bar all right now just track with me don't lose me here so you got your snickers what do you want kit kat baby ruth you good? No, Snickers. Let's go back to Snickers. I like Snickers, all right? So we're going to stick with that one. So you got your basic Snickers. On the outside of the wrapper, it says Snickers candy bar, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, it actually lists, you know, peanuts and caramel and nougat and chocolate and all that really good stuff on, on the inside. So it says that on the outside, but you know what? You don't know for sure that's what's on the inside, do you? Because it's wrapped up. You're just going to take that wrapper for its word. You're going to trust that inside there is this amazing, wonderful Snickers bar. You're going to know, though, for sure when you unconceal it, when you open it up, when you take the wrapper off, and then you bite into it, and you go, yep, it's the candy bar they said it was on the outside. It's got chocolate, peanuts, and nougat. It's all that good stuff. All right. I'm sorry. felt like seventh grade here, but anyway, uh, that's kind of where I live. So, but in the same way, the word truth is just like that. It's, it's un unwrapping, you know, and what's on the inside is this truth that we're looking for. And this is kind of how it's used uh, in this sense. But think about it, too, like this. It's not just truth that's spoken. It's also truth as an idea, a moral truth, or a divine truth that God has revealed to humanity, uh, particularly through Jesus Christ. So when you hear that word truth, you might think of it that way, too, because in the New Testament, more often than not, it means that, a divine truth truth that has been revealed to each one of us, a reality that God needs us to know. So that's kind of where he's going with that. Now, more specifically though, why is it that belt? What does it do? And why is it the most important? Number one, because truth is whatever God says. Very simply, truth is whatever comes out of the mouth of God. Every word that comes from his mouth is truth. And Jesus, when he was praying in John 17, he said it like this, praying to his heavenly Father, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Your word, God, is the truth that we need. And you know, would you agree that we need truth in this world? <laughs> that this is a difficult place to live if we don't know the truths of life and death and all those things, but it's all in here. 
And I think we go looking for it in so many other places, in so many other ways. And God's like, I've already given it to you. In this 66 books, there's over 700 promises. There are these ways that God is trying to talk to us and he's trying to tell us things. And it's like if you're looking for real comfort, it's comfort is right here. If you're looking for encouragement, it's right here. If you're looking for what is the true source of joy and happiness in this world, guess what? It's right here. If you need the answers to life and death, guess what? It's all right here. If you want to know how to live your relationships well and, and do your marriage well and raise your kids, I mean, really, it's all right here. Like this is the source of truth, and this book was inspired by God, written by men, but is the very word of God to us. And you know, I don't know how you think about this, but it seems like over time, I know in the world in general, but specifically in our country, in our culture, we're losing touch with this book. You know, we don't read it like we should. We don't embrace it as we should. We don't commit it to memory the way we should, you know? And so sometimes we find ourselves kind of swimming in a sea of ideas and beliefs and, and all this kind of stuff, and we're not sure what to think because we haven't landed here. And I can think of so many times just in my life, in particular moments, when God's Word has just come to mind, you know? And in times when it's like, you know, I'm looking at that darkness and I'm thinking it looks pretty good right now. And I think about when Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever lives in me lives in that light, not in darkness. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. Jesus is not in that dark place. Jesus is here. He's the light. I'm supposed to be over here. Light leads to life. Darkness leads to death. Every time, once again, I'm reminded of the truth of this world. But it's amazing, you know, the Bible says the word will not return void. In other words, when you commit it to memory, you apply it to your life, it actually plays itself out in your life and in mine. You remember when Jesus was tempted in the desert, Satan came to him, several temptations, but he does the one where he says, look at that stone. He says, why don't you just turn that to, to bread and, and then you'll be fed and you won't be hungry. And Jesus looks at him and he says, man does not live by bread alone. But by what? Remember this one? Every word that comes from the mouth of God. Every word that comes from the mouth of God. And he was saying, listen, what you're trying to offer me is a moment of satisfaction. What God's trying to offer me is a lifetime of satisfaction. And if I'm going to get bread, God's going to give me bread. And so I'm going to depend on him for the bread and for my whole life. And in that moment, he gave us very, something very important to remember in our own lives today. is just that his word is life every time. Now, here's another thing about truth. Truth guards against deception. Truth guards against deception. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Test all things in your life things that you're unclear about, things that you're not sure about, if you're not sure if that's from God or not, test all of that, and then at the end, hold fast to what is good. And in a way, what he's trying to tell us is be on alert. Be on guard. Because lots of ideas are going to come your way. You're going to hear a lot of things. You're going to read a lot of things. Other people are going to tell you things. You need to be on guard. Um several years ago I was out in Seattle Washington I had three days of meetings out there and while I was there I went to the original Starbucks and guess what the coffee tastes just the same as the original as it does right over here in Tiger Town but anyway it is really good and really cool and neat to see that so while I'm down there at Pike Place I walked down the street and went over to the um, fish market you know what I'm talking about they have this famous fish market there in Seattle down by the water and everything and, and so I go there and um, I'm talking to one of the guys that's, that's working the deal, and he's putting ice out and stuff. And, and, uh, and I'm like, is this the place that I've seen on TV where y'all throw the fish? You know? You know what I'm talking about, where they yell and they throw the fish when somebody buys a fish? And I'm just sure I sounded like a redneck from Alabama. Hey, man, this is where y'all throw the fish? Because I'd love to see me throw, throw you a throw fish. So I did. I asked him. And he's like, yeah, yeah. He said, we do that, but only when you buy a fish. And I was like, buy a fish? I mean, these are massive. And I'm like, ah, uh, I said, I'm here on, you know, just for a few days. I'm from Alabama. I'm not going to be buying any fish. He goes, we can ship it. 
I was like, hey, ma'am, I really don't want to fish, but I really appreciate it. But I still would love to see you throw a fish. And he's like, all right, man, let's, let's give this poor guy a fish throw so he can go back to Alabama and tell his buddies so he can tell his church. So sure enough, he grabs a big fish, and they start tossing him back and forth and yelling and screaming the way they do. And, and he, he was like, one day, he handed it to me, like, you want to throw the fish? I'm like, I'm good. I got to go to a meeting. So smelling like that is not going to be helpful. And... Um, but anyway, so after a while, uh, the general manager comes out, and, and he's asking me where I'm from, and we're just having a big conversation. And he launches into this uh, history of how they got Atlantic cod to the west, which, of course, I was just, wow. <laughs> it was like, we don't do cod. But anyway, go ahead. Give me the whole thing. But it was very interesting. He said in the 19th century, um, they decided they wanted to ship this Atlantic cod from Boston all the way around to places like San Francisco and Seattle and all that. Um, but they ran into all these issues with keeping the fish fresh, you know, because that is a seriously long trip, you know, from one coast to the other in that day. So they put, put it in ice. Ice didn't work. Fish go bad. They'd, uh, they'd put the fish in tanks of water. Um, the problem is the fish don't move very much, so by the time they get over there, they're really not very good to eat, and they've kind of gone bad and all this kind of stuff. So... At the next cod fisherman's gathering meeting, I'm not sure what that was, but anyway, all the guys got together and they presented this problem of we're, we're wasting a lot of fish and losing a lot of money trying to get them over there. We need to come up with an idea. And one joker raised his hand and goes, let's stick some catfish in there with them. And they were like, who are you? And who invited you? You know, I mean, what are you talking about? He said, no, I'm serious. Catfish are the natural enemy of cod. And if you put them in the tank, it'll cause the cod to keep swimming. And they were like, throw some catfish in. So they put some catfish in, and sure enough, the cod kept swimming. And they kept them swimming the whole time, all the way over there. And so the fish were in great shape, and they were able to sell it, and everything was, was wonderful. So when you put the enemy of a cod in the tank with it, it keeps the cod moving on alert all the time. You know where I'm going. We're in this tank, and there is this enemy. He is around us and near us and with us all the time. And because of that, we should be alert, eyes open, asking God to give us good discernment between good and bad, right and wrong, what path to take, what choice to make, you know, all those kinds of things. The Bible describes Satan as uh, the father of lies. That's a pretty adequate description, wouldn't you agree with me? Have you ever been lied to by him, you know? Um, his, his whole purpose in life is to trip you up, trip me up. Take something that's good or, or excuse me, something that's bad, something that's wrong, reshape it, put it into your life, interject it. It's a lie, but he wants us to believe that. Jesus, talking about Satan, says this about him in John 8, 44. He says, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And so I'm thinking, what are the lies that, that he might speak to us? What are some things that he might say? He might say something like, you know what, you're not a very good follower of God. You know, you're not a very good son or daughter just mess up a lot have you ever believed that one maybe that's one that if we're not careful can take us down a really bad road where we begin to think yeah I'm not doing a very good job and then we're left with guilt and then we're wondering am I will I ever be good enough for God does he really love me oh he loves to put that in your life or maybe God only loves you when you perform well that's one he'd love to tell you hey it's only when you're really good that he loves you other than that, he really doesn't love you. He don't want anything to do with you. That's another lie. God loves us no matter what. He might say something like, hey, let's not forget your career, your education, your, your bank statement, you know, your, your bank account, your reputation. All of these are first, and then God is next on those list of priorities. He, he's down here. He's okay. He'll be in your life. But you need to get all these other things squared away first. <laughs> and that's an easy one to fall into, isn't it? Sometimes we might actually even believe it or even live our life that way. But we know that when we seek God and his righteousness first, everything else falls into place. 
Or he might say something like power is everything. Whatever you can do to, to have more power, to have more control, that is everything. See, he's the master of lies. He's the master of doubt. He just wants to introduce a little doubt into your life to get you off course. And he will try to destroy your relationships. And we have to be careful because if we give him just a little bit, he's got this, for lack of a better word, crowbar that he loves to just stick in there in between us and our relationships and pry really hard and see if he can get us wedged apart. And that's when he does some of his best work. But here's the last thing in light of that. Truth is found in Jesus. Very simply, but most importantly, truth is found ultimately in Jesus. God sent him to this earth and he became the living representative of the heart of God. If you want to know what God's heart is, read the Gospels, see what Jesus did, see what he said. If you want to know how much God loves you, look at what Jesus did on the cross. If you want to know what God's all about, you just got to look at Jesus' life. And Jesus said this in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. No one has a relationship with God except through me. Nobody goes to heaven except through me. I am the right way. I am the ultimate truth of God's love for you. I am the life that you really want. In your heart of hearts, I represent the life that you really want that nothing else can give you. Now, the challenge with this, and I totally get it, is to get the belt on every day. You know? Soldier is ultimately disciplined and prepared. And I think for us, it's am I putting this belt on? And you know how we do that? We got to read. We need to know this and what God is telling us. And then every day saying, God, would you put your word in my heart? so that today I can discern your will and your way for my life so that I won't give in to an enemy, say things I shouldn't, do things I shouldn't, think things I shouldn't. Help me keep this belt of truth front and center, first thing, every day. Let's pray. Well, God, every one of us in here is very aware that in this life there will be trouble and struggle, conflict, and difficulty in relationships, difficulty keeping our heart and mind squared away with you. And we also know that we can't do that ourselves. And we thank you for the reminder that that there is a battle going on. A spiritual battle that we can't fight alone. And that we need you. And you know, we need your armor. We need your love and your mercy and your grace and your faith. All these things in our life as a way to be protected. And also as a way to move forward, to move out push against the forces of darkness and evil in this world. Spread your love and grace with people that desperately need it. And so God, I'm just praying for all of us that we would make a priority every day to allow you to speak your word into us. To read that, that Bible, to know what you have to say to us about who you are, about our place in this world, and, and what we are to do, and how we are to carry out your will. And that your spirit would strengthen our resolve. And God, we thank you for, this, for the many ways that you have reached out to us, sending us your truth through Jesus, so that we might know you and have a relationship with you and have hope in this life. And today we've come to praise you for that. We pray this prayer in the strong name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ.